Okay, so that's the end of class. <laughs> so we, we're just going to finish talking about the objective in financial management, and then we'll move on to calculating risk. So, the last time we were talking about the objective in financial management, we said that using the stock price is okay because investors think about long-term value, okay? So we can use the stock price. But there are some problems with the stock price, just using the stock price as an objective, which is that managers can put their interest above the stockholders, there can be a cost for society, there could be uh, false information to the financial markets, or the bondholders could be taken advantage of. So we should try to think about all of those people. So <laughs> that's where we finished. So we were going to discuss about uh, these things. So <laughs> to get some solutions, we can choose a different way of doing our corporate governance, a new way, like we already saw some suggestions. Uh, but as well as doing uh, corporate governance, we also suggest this, to reduce the conflict here for the stockholders, the lenders, the financial markets and the social society. <coughs> so, we, we uh, finished up, we mentioned here that these days we have more activist investors Okay, markets are getting punishing firms who are giving the false information, so it's getting a bit better. Uh, bondholders can make some kind of covenant or agreement. Okay, we can make a new type of bond. A new type of bond, an example, is a portable bond. This means that the bondholder can put the bond back to the firm and get face value if the firm takes options that hurts bondholders. So basically it means that I give you a loan, your debt to equity ratio is 50%, and then you increase your debt to equity ratio. Then I can say, we agreed that you wouldn't increase your debt to equity ratio, so you have to give me back the money. Okay? That's a portable bond. Okay, if the rating of the company, we'll talk about ratings later, the rating can show us how risky a company is. Okay? Uh, if the rating goes up, then your company gets more risky, then you have to pay me more interest. Okay? So either you can give me back the money or pay me more interest. So bondholders can make that kind of agreement. So, uh, the financial markets, uh, because of access to information and the internet, information is getting out to markets more quickly. And sometimes, even if the firm wants to delay the information, it can't delay it. Okay? Uh, so, when firms are misleading markets these days, they get a quick and strong punishment if they are dishonest. Okay? Uh, these days, about the society, Socially responsible investing is growing. So socially responsible investing means that uh, there is an agreement called the PRI, which is Principles of Responsible Investment. So it means that if we sign this treaty, then we are going to think about environmental and economic factors before we make any investment decision. So we can quickly check the PRI uh, here. It's the UN Principles for Responsible Investment. Do you understand principle? Principle. So <coughs> there are six principles and you have to sign the document. Okay, so these are the six principles. Principle one, we will incorporate ESG issues environment, 
E, S, society, social. G, governance, issues, into investment analysis and decision making processes. Okay? So more and more investment funds and banks are signing this pledge. It means that they're going to think about the environment and social issues and governance before they invest in a company. So if the company is doing the bad performance against the environment or against society, uh, then they're not going to invest there. Okay? So we can see what, who has signed. This will also give us an idea of who. We have signatories, current signatories. Right? Asset owners, investment managers, professional service partners. So, asset owners, we can say, do you know AXA, Barclays Bank, Retirement Fund? So this gives us an idea of investors in the markets, right? Pension, pension funds, okay? Retirement funds, uh, those kind of things. We also have government funds, or just funds of oil-rich countries, right? This is a Catholic fund from the church, okay? Do you understand fund? Fund is money, is put together. Okay? Here we have investment managers. Okay? So these are managing investments and managing funds. Uh, let's see if we can find any Korean one. Japan, Asha Life Assets. No, no, nothing from South Korea so far. Tell me if you see South Korea. We can see Japan. So Korea can still develop their fund and investment industry. But I guess that the Korean government pension fund probably signed this kind of principle. Most pension funds, pension funds tend to be a little bit more responsible when they're investing. They think more about the environment and society and those kind of things, especially the government ones. So, a lot of companies, but not from South Korea, right, signed this, uh, these principles. So because of this kind of uh, agreements or pledges, uh, companies need to be more aware of the environment and those kind of things. Okay? If the company fails to meet societal norms, it can lead to a loss of business and value, and also a loss of investment. Not as many people will invest in the company. So, this sums up the counter-reaction. So, for the conflict between stockholders and managers, more activist investors. Okay? For the society, more laws. Okay? Investors are having a backlash against the companies. Investors won't invest in the companies if they're bad companies. More and more. Okay? Financial markets, firms are punished, and the bondholder can make a covenant to protect themselves. So, then discuss this question with your partner. What can managers do to make less? The problems of conflict with stockholders, society, bondholders, and financial markets. Conflict is like argument. Thank <laughs> you. 
stock holders and bond holders. Okay. First question is with corporate governance. Okay. First one is under the heading corporate governance. Second one in the book is bondholders and stockholders. Third one, managers and financial markets. And the last one, stakeholders and society. So what do we need to do? <coughs> Summed up on this slide. Okay, so, uh, Trey Suji, have you found the answer? Stockholders and managers. <laughs> we said that the problem is that corporate governance doesn't work well and the stockholders cannot control the managers. Okay? Do you understand stockholders? Do you understand the word stockholders? You don't understand stockholders? Okay, stockholder is the person is the owner of the company. Okay? They own the stock of the company. So just generally, the first few weeks we're going to meet a lot of words, new words, like I explained at the start of the course. Okay? So I think you need to learn the word at the start of the course. You need to work hard at the start of the course. Do you understand? If you see a word that's said in the class 10 times, like stockholder, that means you didn't understand, you need to look up stockholder in the dictionary and find out what it means, okay? Because we're going to talk about stockholder a lot during the course, okay? So the first few weeks, you hear different words repeated, like bonds, or stocks, or other things. Right, you need in the book there is definition of all those things in the brackets, okay? So especially for the first few weeks you need to read the book after the class. Okay, that's why I made the book. Okay? And you need to look up the words in the dictionary. Because if you don't do that in the first few weeks, then you're not going to be able to follow the course. If you don't know what a stockholder is now, you're not going to know in week ten or in week fifteen, okay? You're, you're going to be lost. So it means that you need to study hard at the start of the course, especially. Do you understand? If you study hard at the start of the course especially, then it's going to help you a lot to follow the course, because later it's going to be easier. You learn the important vocabulary at the start of the course, so it makes it a lot easier. But you never learn the important vocabulary, then you're always going to be lost. Okay? Do you understand? 
That's why in the first few chapters I have put in brackets or put the definition of all the important words. And at the end of the chapter we have some vocabulary, explaining the vocabulary. Okay? So if you look at the, for example, page 27, we have about 10 or 12 important words here, right? On question number 25, like yields. Transaction cost, default, bankruptcy. They're words we will need. Okay? On page 35, stakeholder, institutional investor, insider, group thing. Okay? All these words have the definition in the book. So, stock and bond is very basic. We explained in the week one what stocks are, what bonds are. Okay? Stockholder is the owner of the, of the stock. So, can anybody answer this question, the first question? How can we reduce the conflict between stockholders and managers? More activist investors, right? Anything else? Anything else? We also looked at, uh, we can look at the book, right? We have the corporate governance. So improving corporate governance, okay? On page 31, there are some suggestions for improving corporate governance. Number one, managers own stock, okay? Number two, improve the performance of the board of directors. Number three at the top of page 32, more activist investors, okay? We can see here. So there are the three main points that we need to do. So can you see, can you read the book after the class? Again, okay, it's just two pages. And if you don't understand the words, look up the word, use the dictionary, okay? You have, you can use the neighbor you do, or you can use the investopedia to look up the definitions of the word. Okay, then uh, the second one, Trey G. Su. Yes, how can we reduce the conflict between the bondholders and the stockholders? Can you say that again? You had your hand over your mouth. Yes, that's the problem. What's the solution? So look at the slide. What is the solution? What? Okay, Che Hyungyu. Where is Che Hyungyu? Yes. Pyo Seimin, where is Pyo Seimin? Yes? 
Yes, they can write in covenants, okay, and we just mentioned Yeah, so the firm can lose their reputation. Okay, we can make it a new type of bond, we just explained, okay? New types of bonds where we don't get paid, we get paid our money back if the company does something wrong. Or we get paid a higher interest. Okay, uh, the <coughs> next one, Huang In Young. Huang In Young, what about society? Okay, so these days investors are more worried about environment, okay? They have the PRI we talked about, they signed the PRI and we can make more laws. Okay, and then what about managers and financial markets? One, John Ho. Ernest? Honest? Um, <laughs> our managers can look to investors to, um, to stock, uh, stakeholders to find out how they do with their social responsibility decisions. We talked about that. What about the financial markets? Oh, financial markets. <laughs> um, they can regulate them. Uh, So who is regulating what? Well, the, the, the managers, the owners and the managers regulate. Hmm? The owners and the managers. What are they regulating? Uh, uh, the information to get um, from the public so they delay Tell them information and tell them Yes, that's the problem. But the question is, what's the solution? Oh. What's the solution in this case? We can make more regulations. Anything else? They get punished by investors. Okay? Investors punish the managers. If the managers give the bad information, they can get punished by the financial markets. We explained about the case with Greece. So to sum up on this point of the objective of financial manager, we should uh, look at increasing the stock price, but also consider this relationship, the relationship between the stockholders and the managers, the relationship between the society, the financial markets and the bondholders. They are called stakeholders. Okay? Stakeholder is anybody who has an interest in the organization. So we have to consider these people and the conflicts, okay? At the same time, trying to increase the stock price. Okay, so not only trying to increase the stock price, increasing the stock price and thinking about all of these things. Okay? So do you have any question about the objective of financial managers? The goal of financial managers? <laughs> So let's look at page 34, just the last part of the conclusion to sum up. 
So while focusing on increasing stock price, managers should also focus on long-term value. Number two, improve the corporate governance we talked about. Okay. Uh, number three, improve the communication of information to the public. And number four, understand and listen to the rights of all stakeholders, including the environment, society. Okay. Think about all of those things while increasing the stock price. Okay. So then let's move on to the next part. So we're going to talk about uh, risk. So we already started to talk about uh, risk. Uh, earlier about when we talked about diversification and the risk-free rate. So let's look at, again, the risk-free rate in a little bit more detail. So for an investment to be risk-free, two conditions have to be met. There should be no default risk, which generally means the bond has to be issued by the government. Default means uh, the company goes out of business. They can't pay back the loan. Okay? So the company defaults means they don't pay back the loan. So default risk is an important word. Okay? Does everybody understand default risk? The risk that the company doesn't pay back the money. Okay? Did everybody understand that? Default risk? The risk the company doesn't pay back the money. Or the government don't pay back the money. Okay? So for a bond uh, investment to be risk-free, there has to be no default risk, okay? So it means that it's probably a government bond, because most companies are going to have some default risk, okay? You might say, well, Coca-Cola has been existing for 100 years, so you could try to make an argument that Coca-Cola has no default risk, right? But most people would say maybe Coca-Cola has slightly more default risk than the government, because it's a private company, okay? Do you think, would you lend money to Coca-Cola? Do you trust Coca-Cola? Do you think there's any difference between Coca-Cola and the US government, or no difference? Small difference, very small difference, right? That the US government really no chance of bankruptcy, but Coca-Cola, very, very small chance it could go bankrupt, right? Suddenly they put a big tax on sugar drinks. Right? And Coca-Cola lose a lot of money, okay? Or a new regulation about not selling soft drinks to kids. So, the second point is there should be no uncertainty about reinvestment rates. So, uh, it means that we are sure that we are going to get the interest payments. So, default risk means, here the definition, the chance that the issuer of the bond will not repay the bond when it matures, or the loan. <clears throat> so using a government bond, uh, we can see that the risk-free rate is going to be the government bond. So we use the correct government bond for the correct currency. If we're investing in Europe, what government bond are we going to use? What country's government bond will you use as risk-free in Europe? Germany. Germany. Okay. If we invest in Japan, what Japanese yen? We use the gov Japanese yen government bond. U US, US dollars. So we can see the bond rates on the different countries. So, we talked about yield in the first week, right? Yield is basically including the difference between the price now and the price at the end, and also including the interest rate. I think one of your questions in your worksheet is to do with yield. So we can see in the Americas, the United States, 1.79%. So this is the risk-free rate in US dollars at the moment, okay? Your, your company offers me Profit of 1.5% a year. Am I going to invest in your company? No, I can get 1.8% if I invest in US government bonds. Okay? 
why would I invest in, in your company for 1.5%? We can see Brazil, Brazil is going to be higher because inflation is higher in Brazil, okay? Also, Brazil has some default risk. Uh, Canada, no, no default risk, so we're investing in Canada, 1.22%. In Europe, you're not going to make much money if you invest in German government bonds, 0.15%, okay? So low inflation in Europe, and also German bonds is kind of safe haven, safe haven for people to invest their money. Uh, the UK, we invest in pounds, it's 1.4%. Okay? Do you think, we'll talk about more later, which bond are you going to invest in here? We can see Greece. Greece and Germany, they both use the same currency, euros, so they have the same inflation. They both use the same currency. But Germany is 0.015% and Greece is 8%. So you can get 8% if you invest in Greece, or just 0.15% if you invest in Germany. Where do you want to invest? Germany. Germany, why? You get more money if you invest in Greece. If you put your money in the bank, you'll just get 1%. Why don't you buy Greek bonds? You can get 8%. Hmm? The only way you lose your money is if, if Greece defaults. Okay? So this is showing the default risk between Greece and Germany. Okay? People think there's a 7% chance, basically, that or 8% chance that Greece, Greece might default, okay? So that's the difference, also called the spread, okay? So that still means there's a 90% chance that Greece won't default, most probably won't default. So some people like risk, they'll invest in the Greek bond, and then Greek doesn't default, they make more money, they laugh at you, invest in Germany, right? Just to got a low amount of money. What about in Asia? South Korea, 1.8%. So I invest in your business in Korea. I'm, you're going to have to make more than 1.8%. Otherwise, I'll just invest in Korean bonds. Okay? Australia, 2.5%. Japan, negative yields. Japan, traditionally low inflation. Japan even has deflation. Okay? Very low inflation. It means that the money is worth the same this year and next year. Not much difference because they don't have any inflation or very low deflation. Okay? So, uh, Japan also low growth these days. So, that's just an overview of the risk free uh, rates. So, We can see here, uh, in 2009, the risk-free rates in Europe were very similar, okay? This is the two-year bond and the 10-year bond. All of them were around 4%, okay? But we had the crisis in 2009, and it changed. This is 2012. Greece's was 35% in 2012, and all the other countries are still down low. Portugal up to 15%. So this is just before Greece defaulted, okay? So Greece defaulted in, not an official default, but the people who had the Greek money agreed to take 50% haircut. Haircut means they agreed to give up 50% of their bond. Okay? They're not going to get paid back. So that's why the, you would have got 35% if you invested in the Greek bond. Okay? But you were taking a chance. And in the end, Greece did. Uh, default, practically. Okay? So we can see the default risk here, big difference between Greece and another country. But countries don't default too commonly, right? Recently we had Uruguay, Argentina, right? Greece. It's not that common an occurrence for a country to default. So uh, if a government has default risk, Right, the government bond will have a default spread. Spread is difference between the lower number and the higher number. Okay? So, uh, trade G sub. What is spread? What does spread mean? Yeah. 
So I just explained what Spread was doing, but you weren't listening, right? So you need to listen and pay attention in the class. Okay, Spread is an important word you're going to have to use again in the future. You need to understand, okay? So pay attention, please. Okay, so Spread is the difference between the lower number and the higher number, okay? The difference between a low interest rate and a high interest rate is called the spread. So spread has different meanings in English. We can spread butter on the bread, okay? But we can also, we have a spread, means a difference, basically difference. So default spread is the difference of the chance of default between two countries. So what's the default spread between today, between Greece and Germany? Can anybody tell me? About 7 or 8 percent. Okay, that's the difference between them. So, there are three choices when we have, we have to make when this is the case. So first of all, we can change the local currency rate for default risk. So let's have a look at an example. It's clearer. Okay, in May 2009, the Indian government bond rate was 7 percent. Okay, the currency rating from Moody's was BA2. And the default spread for a BA2 rated country bond was 3%. Therefore, the risk free rate is the rate minus the risk for India, default risk for India, and this is the risk free rate for India. Okay? So, this is the rate for India, including the default risk for India. This is minus the default risk for India, and then this is a risk free rate for India, which is just inflation and the real interest rate, okay? So a government which has default risk, we need to take out the default risk in order to get the risk-free rate for that country. Do you understand? So Greece currently has default risk, right? So we need to take out the Greek <coughs> default risk before we can say the risk-free rate for Greece. Because risk-free means what it means, right? No risk. It can't be a risk-free rate if we have default risk. So we have to take out the default risk from the country. Uh, so we have rating agencies like Moody's. So the job of the rating agencies is to give a rating to the government. Okay? So uh, <coughs> they look at the government's accounts, money coming in, money going out, government debt, all those things, and then they make a rating, like AAA is the best rating. And this is called a credit rating. So, just a second, this is in Korean. Mm, where is credit rating here? Debt. Where is it? Dongbu. Xinyang Dongbu. Okay, so maybe the Korean can help us, right? Xinyang Dongbu, credit rating. Okay, people can also have a credit rating. If you don't pay back your loan to the bank, you're going to have a bad credit, bad credit rating. So it's the same for governments. So they look at all the countries, and these three are the three main agencies SP, Moody's, and Fitch. Okay? Those companies look at the GDP. Do you understand GDP? Gross domestic product. Okay? Look at inflation. They look at debt. Debt to GDP. How much debt does the government have? And they say, they tell us about the default risk. Okay? This government has this much default risk. This government has this much default risk. So they use a, a rating. We can see the best rating is AAA, right? Different companies, S&P, AAA, 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 okay? What country is that? Hold you, right? 97. This is just trading economics make their own rating. So AAA means no default risk, okay? Australia has no default risk. What about another company here, country here? Argentina. Now, Argentina, defaulted in 2001, okay? And it still hasn't paid monies back that it was supposed to pay back to investors. 
So Argentina is having a hard time at the moment getting loans. They just elected a new government and they never paid back the money. But the new government is thinking about paying back the money, some of the money. The reason is nobody, no investors will give them a loan now, right? So they can't get money easily in the financial markets because investors don't trust them, okay? It's because they didn't pay back the money they were supposed to pay from the last time. So the new government is planning to pay back the money and they hope after they pay back the money, then they can go in and lend more money in the markets. Okay, so currently Argentina has got a really bad rating. Okay, it's down here at 20. Cease AAA1. So they're, they're telling investors don't lend money to Argentina. And investors are not lending money to Argentina. Because there's a high chance Argentina is not, you won't get your money back. Okay, because probably they're going on the history. And they're a little bit angry with Argentina. So uh, we can find a rating for all the different countries uh, here. You know, there's not that many countries that are AAA, uh, just a few, right? The Netherlands, Norway, uh, South Korea maybe AA. Where is South Korea? Not under. For Spain. They have input? Yes. yes. A minus is not too bad. So a little bit of default risk in Korea. So if we saw that the Korean government bond rate was 1.8%, okay? Korean, on the Bloomberg we saw it was 1.8%. Is that the risk-free rate for Korea? No. No, why not? Default risk. Korea has default risk, a little bit of default risk. Okay, so this is not the risk-free rate, the market yield on the bond, okay? So we need to go find a table. Later we'll see there's a table. And we will see AA minus equals, let's say 0.1%. Okay? So then we look at the table and we see we, have, we need to change to 1.7%. Okay? So this is the risk-free rate for Korea. Okay? So the rating from the rating agency tells us the default risk for the country. And then we can change this default risk into a percentage. We can use a table. There's a table online. Okay? And then we, we use the, take away the percentage from the market rate, gives us the risk free rate. Do you have any question about that? Getting the risk free rate for a country with default risk? No? Okay, then let's take a break for 10 minutes.